If you'll open your Bibles to the book of Acts, we're in a, our Sunday study has been how to identify a healthy church and how to become a healthy church. And uh, I have, I don't even know how many studies we've done, but we've done more than two. <laughs> we've done several. And here we are in Acts 17. When I was going through my theological training, I took a course. Um, I'm not sure it might have been it might have been a required course at at Sanford uh, for all students. Uh, Kurt, do you? World religions. Yeah, uh huh. Yeah, it was a very interesting course on the world religions and um, how Christianity fit within it. I tell you, it always disturbs me when they call Christianity a religion. We are not a religion. That is for sure. If you did a study of all the religions, Christianity wouldn't even be, they, they, uh, they, they would not be accepted into the group. <laughs> They would not be accepted. If there was a, a union of the world religions, they would never let Christianity in. Never. And uh, Acts is all about that. Christianity is born in the, the whole book of Acts is about the birth of the church, of the birth of Christianity, uh, beginning with Acts 2. Uh, at Pentecost, I mean, even Pentecost shows you that Christianity is lights out. I mean, it's, it literally lights out all over the world. Christianity becomes the light to the whole world. But what the book of Acts is about is about Christianity conquering the world uh, of religions. It's swept through. As Christianity swept through the Roman Empire, it swept religion right out of existence. It swept them away. You know why? Because the gospel, there's nothing. No religion has a gospel like Christianity. Christianity, Christianity changes the very being of man. The very being of his existence. That's why they called it being born again. Born again. I, I, regeneration is the most phenomenal doctrine you could ever study in your life. Generation is how we get here. Regeneration is how we get with God. You can't get to God in generation. You can only get to God through regeneration, through Jesus Christ. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one. <laughs> no one. Say no one. <laughs> no one. No one, I don't care. You can join 15 of those religions. It's all based on generation. It's not based on regeneration. Christianity is just lights out, and we're going to talk about that today. I don't know if I'll get to two studies, but I got two studies, um, and um, we'll see. I got them ready to go, but I don't know where we'll go with it. But here we are in Acts 17. And he introduces where on the second missionary trip, Paul's he, book of Acts covers Paul's three with anticipation of a fourth to go to, uh, to work out of Rome and sweep westward into, the, into uh, Europe. Uh, when, they went to, uh, when he went to the call of Macedonia, it was a call to go westward to Europe. It was considered Europe. In fact, it still is. And, uh, of course, a lot of the occupation of it thinks Eastern, but uh, they called it Europe. When they went to uh, Macedonia, they called it going to Europe. And here we are in Acts 17. So he's on his journey, and uh, he comes to Thessalonica, and he stops at a synagogue to speak to the Jews because they were the mono, monotheistic group of people. 
everybody else were, was polytheistic. Everybody else was part of a religion that believes in a, a multitude of gods. So when Paul would go someplace, because God consciousness is a key to gospel hearing. So when he went to a place, he went almost always went to seek out monotheistic people or people who believed in one God. And so he always went to a Jewish synagogue, which he was comfortable with because that's what he grew up with. And so he was comfortable with that as well, theologically and uh, the way they operated and everything. And so there's what he's done. He's in Thessalonica. Uh, in, in Acts 16, 9 and 10, he has the call to go to Macedonia, Europe, and, and westward. And so he, he's been faithful to that. He's gone to there. And so here we are in Macedonia in a city called Thessalonica. Here we are. Now we move. And he, and he went to a synagogue because the most likely people to listen to him and give him an ear would be those who were positive to one God. Because when he says, God sent his only begotten son, they, they got an idea, oh, the one God, if he went to anybody else, they well, which God are you talking about? Just to give you an example, so it narrowed, it narrowed a lot of conversation down. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them, I just explained that, uh, for three Sabbath reasoning with them out of the scriptures, that's the old covenant, that's the old, what we would call the Old Testament. And he was explaining, watch this, and giving evidence out of the scripture that Christ had to suffer, that's die on a cross, and be raised again, resurrection from the dead. Saying this was a theme of his message. This Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. He's the anointed Messiah, Savior, not just of the Jew, but of the world. That, see, that's, that's back to Isaiah 42, 6, and 49, uh, chapter 49. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas. These were the two guys on the second missionary trip. Watch this now. Some of them talking about Jews out of the synagogue, along with a great multitude of the God-fearing Greeks. You know what that means? means that these were the people that were being persuaded by Judaism to believe in one God. Because they, they believed in a multitude of gods. They had a God for everything. You know, if you blew your nose, well, that's a certain God. A God-fearing Greeks say those, say, I, I say well, who would, that, who would that be like? Well, that would be like Cornelius in Acts 10 and 11. That Roman centurion, that's what that'd be like. And a number of the leading women. Oh, that, yeah, I can't begin to tell you how important that is because, you see, Christianity is unique in that every person in Christ is equal. Is equal. No. Every person in Christ is equal. Galatians, the third chapter, uh, you know, 26 through 28. Uh, no male, no, no, no uh, Jew, no Greek, no male, no female, you know, and he goes down this list. And you know what he's talking about? Christianity, Christianity, you talk about, you talk about equality. You, listen, <laughs> they take Christ out of the school system. It is the breath of freedom and equality. They've gone to the world system in the school through Christ out, which is the only true system of freedom and equality the world has ever known. Are we not insane? And in the South, for us to allow that in the South, over federal money is a disgrace to our heritage. It's a disgrace. Over money. Take your money and go back to Washington.
but the Jews. Verse 5, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. And coming upon the house of J Jason, where they were meeting, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. And when they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, I, lo I love this line. This line you should remember forever. These, watch this, these men, Paul and Silas, Christians with a very clear message, mechanic gospel of grace, these men have upset the world. I love the King James in this. They turned the world upside down, <laughs> which means they turned them right side up. <laughs> yeah. We live in a world that's turned wrong side down, and the gospel turns them right side up. And what we don't preach the gospel nor more is beyond me. These men, they're being charged with setting the world upside down, which is really right side up. Shows you how insane people are in evil. Evil makes you think insane. That's insane to think this way. These men who have, who have upset the world, oh boy, upset the world, have come here now. Something's happened within Christianity that we don't do this anymore. We used to do this a lot. We did it in the South. We don't do it anymore. We haven't done it since probably the 70s or 80s. We've become mellow yellow or something. I don't know what we've become. Well, this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm talking about Christianity in a world of religions. We don't compete with them. When I took that course, I gave the professor what he wanted to hear and got my, got my I don't know what I got, probably a C. I don't know. I was a C student. Closed the book and said, thank you, God, that I belong to Christianity because it dominates the world. These people, all these world religions, so I stopped studying them. I don't care what the Hindus believe. I don't care what, what the, the, the Buddhists or the Hindus or the Wazoos or whatever. I don't care because I know that I need to be very clear on my message because it beats them every time. Theirs is based on generations. Mine's based on regeneration. Theirs turns the world upside down. Mine turns it right side up. Puts it back to where they ought to be with God, the creator of this whole business. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're so thankful for these who have come our way. I pray they would understand the principle, though. This Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't study it, nor can you live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. What do we do with it? We confess it. 1 John 1, 9, we confess our sins. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, to restore us uh, back from carnality into spirituality so the Holy Spirit can teach us the truth of the Word of God. We need to be a people, Father. We need to be a church that turns the world right side up. We need to be that church. We have the gospel. We have the power of God in every avenue of our being. Set us on fire. Set us on fire in the world is my prayer through this lesson in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, I gave you my introduction with this thing. Let's look at three aspects 
of Christianity in a world of religions today. Christianity does not compete with other world religions. Don't let people tell you that we're a religion. We're not a religion. All the religion in the world, they got together, would vote us out. They know they cannot compete with us. They cannot compete with the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it, Romans 1.16. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it. Because it produces regeneration. It creates within a person a person who has lost his true identity in God is restored through the blood of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, you die in Adam, you are brought back to life in Christ. We all die in Adam, we all live in Christ. And what does that transformation, how does that happen? Christ dies on that cross for our sins. He's buried on the third day, raised from the dead. It's called the gospel. And when you believe it, you receive it. And he turns your life upside right. It brings you back into that family relationship where God is not your creator. God is your daddy father. I don't think of God. I haven't thought one time as God is my creator since I got born again. I thought about God as a creator before I got saved. I promise you, I haven't thought about it except when I teach it. I've never thought about him, some kind of creator out there, invented the telephone or something. I don't even think that way. I think of a daddy, a guy who takes care of me, cares about my every whim. It's more of a parent to me than I've ever been parented in my life. Never think about him that that terms. Oh well, here comes God. You better better, 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 better get your get your face on right. Here comes God. Watch out. Well, here comes God. I don't think that way. I don't think that way. One day in my life, I don't think that way. I haven't thought that way since I got saved. I haven't thought that way because He truly is. A Romans 8, 14, 17 phenomena. He really is a person who has come into my life as a father, daddy. Now, there's a difference between those two things. You know, a father gives birth to somebody. A daddy goes to the ball games. <laughs> I don't care. He don't care what the boss says. My boy's playing ball. I'm going to the ball game. I'm just telling you, there's a difference between being a father and being a daddy, and God has called both of those to us in Romans the eighth chapter, verses fourteen through seventeen, and Galatians the fourth chapter, verses four through seven. He's called an Abba, Pater. And I'm so thankful for that. <laughs> I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful that he cares about the least little things going on. Cares about my aspirations. Didn't just give me birth. God didn't just give me birth. God didn't just give me birth. He's walked me every day, every moment of my life. God's walked me out. Didn't just give birth to me. It wasn't just about birth. So we just sang that song. We just sang. That was the song we sang. God will take care of me every day all the way. Every day all the way. I'm so thankful for that. I mean, do you ever tell him you're thankful that he's your daddy? Do you ever tell him that? I tell him that all the time. So, Christianity is not in competition with the rural religions. They can't stand, they cannot, listen, we sweep right over them. Whew, right over them. Now, we don't get out of there without a fight, You're, it's obvious. 
but there's no, there are no competition. We are not, com we are not in competition with Judaism, a monotheistic religion. We're not in competition with Islam, a monotheistic religion. Because they don't have a gospel of regeneration. It's all about generation and works. That was, that's what makes religion religion is man working to, to appease God and find some kind of relation out of his good efforts. We don't believe in that one minute. We're all about grace. I don't believe that. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, that the Jews, a monotheistic religion, didn't believe. Listen to what he said. Do you think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets? I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. Do you know when he said, I didn't come to abolish the law or the prophets, you know what he said? He just said the Old Testament. When you say law and prophet together, or you say prophet and scripture to, or, or writings together, when you say those, that covers that whole old, that covers the old, the old covenant canon. I didn't come to take away the old covenant canon. I came to fulfill it. The law, the prophets, and the writings made up the that made up. So when he says that. He's talking about the entire Old Testament scriptural basis. I didn't come to abolish it. I came to fulfill it. I came to complete it, to bring it into its journey of life. I didn't come to kill it. I came to give it life. And how is it? Has he not put life into the scriptures? Oh, my goodness. You know how he does it? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and just lightens it up in your life if you're a spiritual person. It's not a dead book. It's only a dead book to a dead person. To a living person that looks to the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will light the Word of God up in your soul in ways you could never imagine. You talk about getting high. You need alcohol or drugs. Well, you try the Holy Spirit a while. Let him take you into the word of God and lighten it up. He will lighten your souls in ways that you can't imagine. There's no way that you can compete with Christianity with that kind of a, a program. There's no way. And w that is our normal. That's our 101 program. That's our simple introductory program of Christianity. I've not talked about anything other than just our introduction. It's a phenomenal thing to be a Christian. People are ashamed to be Christians, whether among other people. Oh, I better not speak that way. I better not. Listen, you're the light of the world. Why would you be ashamed? I love what Paul says in, in Romans 1. I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation everyone believes. It turns the world right side up. You realize we are those people. We are those people. We are those people. We keep reading, oh boy, Paul went and did this and all did all that. We are those people. It is our turn. We've, we rode the bench while Paul was on, the pl was the player. Paul's retired. They've hung his jersey up in the Hall of Fame, and we're playing the game. <laughs> we need to play it well. Galatians, the fifth chapter, Galatians, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 6 and verse 13, you know what he talks about? Freedom. You're never free until you're in Christ. You're a slave. You're either a slave to Adamic sin or you're a slave to the world system. You are a slave. I don't care if you're black, white, purple, or whatever. You're a slave. You'll always be a slave. Nobody can free you from it except Jesus Christ. We think we're free today because some kind of constitution or something. You are never free apart from Jesus Christ. Never free. Quit lying to people. 
The church should be the voice of reason and truth. Would I go to a black church and preach this? Oh, yeah, and I have. Why would I not preach the truth? Not free. Now, I'll tell you what, it, what free is. Galatians 5.1. Listen to this. It was for freedom, true freedom, that Christ set us free. Do you know when you got set free from the whole world system? Who always speaks down to you and never builds you up, always tears you down. Does the world not always tear you down? Listen, every time I meet somebody, I know what's happened. You've, you've got sucked into the world view. That's not the view of Christ, is it? It's not the view. He's a son, you're a son. He's a priest, you're a priest. He's eternal life, you're eternal life. He's an heir, you're an heir. He's got the inheritance, he's gave it to you. You're the noble child of the king of kings and the Lord of lords. You gotta lift that head high. Nobody, nobody like you but another believer who's been born like you into the kingdom. We're kingdom people. We're in the world, but not of the world. We're kingdom people. Let's go out and be kingdom people. We are different than the world. And the world loves us for it. In Galatians 5.13, Paul says, we've been called by God in freedom. We've been called to freedom. Why aren't you free? You've been called. Christ has set you free. He has called you into freedom. Live as free people. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about spiritually. You know, when Paul was in prison, he was still free. And Paul, why are you in prison? Preaching the gospel? People get saved? You betcha. How many? Enough to put me in jail? <laughs> I got enough people saved that they put me in jail as a threat to their society. Hoo-ah! And he was he happy, and he sang, and he preached. And he considered a privilege to be in jail for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. There was a guy that was free. <laughs> there was a guy that was free. Are you free? Listen, if you're not free, you have been set to be free, then live in your freedom. You're not living in your freedom. You're living in your slavery. Where does that come from? World. What have you been freed from? Slavery. Slavery to yourself, slavery to your sin nature, slavery to sin. You've been, you've been set free. You've been set free. Live in your freedom. Live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Live in the power of the Word of God. Live in the power of the Word that fulfills itself within your soul and brings it out in the way you behave. That's freedom. You know that freedom? Listen to Titus 3, 5. He saved us. Now watch this. He saved us. It's on your paper. He saved us not on the basis of our deeds or works, which we have done in righteous good works, but according to his mercy. You know what mercy is? Look, justice has declared you condemned. You have set absolutely knowing I, I'm condemned. Mercy comes along and says, I'm going to release you from every bit of it. But sir, I'm guilty. I know. How is it possible you would let me off? Because somebody else paid your debt. Somebody else paid for your crime. I didn't know you could get off if somebody else would pay for your crime. I know. It's called grace. Grace. And it functions under mercy, which is an important clause of justice. 
And the only way that mercy can work is because of God's great grace. He sets aside the justice because it has been rectified by a system that God approves of, the death of his own son. And he has the right, under the principle of grace, he has the right to release them, absolutely guilty of all the charges on them, to release them under a clause called mercy. And it's not based on favor. You say, most of, most of the stuff, when we let people off in America today, it's usually political favors. We don't let them off based on mercy. It's always political. Here is Barabbas and here is Jesus. Who do you want? We want Barabbas. Well, I could do that because I'm Caesar and I let one off on this holiday called Passover because it reflects freedom of redemption. <laughs> you know what he's talking about. What did the people, who did the people choose? The criminal. The one who steals and takes everything from him and will kill him in a heart, in a blink of an eye. And who, 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 did, they, who did they put to death? The most innocent man they had ever met in their entire life. The world doesn't have a chance when the gospel shows up. The world doesn't have a chance when the gospel shows up. They've already killed a messenger. They can't kill him again. And so it's all written in stone. All we have to do is carry the message. The message is eternal. All we do is carry the message. He saved us not on the basis of the works which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit. And that sets us apart from all the world religions. They not, nobody has that. <laughs> and nobody. Absolutely nobody. And if they show it to you, it's artificial. It won't hold up under examination. Galatians 2.16. We are Jews by nature and not sinners among the Gentiles. You know what he means by that? He said the Jewish nation is one of the most privileged nations of all the nations of the world of all time. The priest nation of Israel. As a divine agency. And what he means by this is they were born, listen to me, what this means is that they were born in the divine agency of redemption responsibilities they were the carriers of the message. And all of them, because of the great privilege of being born in the environment of holiness, it was easier for them to be saved in that system like Abraham in Galatians 3.8. Abraham was saved by the same gospel as you were saved by, according to Galatians 3.8. He got saved by a prophetic gospel. You get saved by a historical gospel of the prophetic seed of Christ becoming the historical seed who dies on a cross. Abraham, how did he get saved? By the gospel of Jesus Christ, the prophetic gospel. And the Jews were born into this, this divine, divine agency of the priest nation. They were a kingdom of priests. They were the carriers of the messages, and yet they all had to be saved, saved the same way as we by the gospel of Christ. And when it came time to embrace that and go to the world with that message, they killed him. We are Jews by nature, is what they mean by that, and not sinners among the Gentiles. Were Jews sinners? Of course they were. All are born under a damning sin. He told Nicodemus that. The big teacher in Israel, I mean the top gun, professor to professor, that's what he told him. 
He says, we, we are Jews by nature, and not sinners like among the, not the polytheistic world religions. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we may be justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law, since by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. No flesh. Uh, that covers just about the whole deal, doesn't it? <laughs> No flesh. No flesh. Oh, Ron, you probably, I've got this best friend of mine. He's a Jewish guy. He goes to church all the time. And he prays all the time. And he's just a good guy. And he's very charitable. And he's just a wonderful guy. Have you given him the gospel? No, he's Jewish. Have you given him the gospel? No, he's Jewish. Well, Christ died for him. Why don't you give him the, I mean, a Jew, just, a Jew, how about a Jew to a Jew? Because that Jew's going to go to hell if he doesn't believe in Christ. Then bring a Jew to a Jew. And that's ought to be the easiest one in the world. That's what Jesus did with Nicodemus. <laughs> Jeez. All of mankind is classified a sinner in need of salvation. All of mankind is classified a sinner in need of grace salvation, whether they're religious or non-religious. Romans, five chapters of Romans. <laughs> Can you not read five little chapters? Five little chapters in Romans. It has set your world afire. All mankind is classified as sinner. In Romans, the third chapter, verse 10, he says, there are none righteous, no, not one. That's pretty clear when, he gets it, when you get down to no, not one. I spoke to this whole group of people sitting here today, and I said, no, not one. Did I miss anybody? <laughs> if I did, I didn't mean to. No, not one. That's pretty clear information. No, not one. Teacher walks into class after, after giving a, a final exam, and the kids are waiting to find out who got a grade and whether they passed. And she said, no, not one. <laughs> Be a tough day right there, wouldn't it? No, not one. And of course, you would go up after class and say, you must have been talking about him next to me because he's not a very bright person. I'm sure you didn't mean me. And the professor would look you straight in the eye and say, what do you think no, not one? Ooh, no, not one means. <laughs> no, not one. In Romans, the third chapter, 22 through 24, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Watch this now. For all who believe it is. Oh, that's available. Oh, yes, that's available. It's available to whosoever wants it, but only to those who believe it get it. Oh, you mean, Ron, I don't have to do two laps around the church and believe? No. No. The righteousness of God comes through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. There is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know what the glory of God is? Write this down. Write this down. Now, you think you know? Write this down. You'll know. 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, 3 and 4. It tells you what it is. You know what the glory of God is? Hmm? It's the person of Jesus Christ. The person and work of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, 3 and 4 tells you. You don't have to guess about it. Being, being justified as a gift by his grace through redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. Isn't that, isn't that marvelous? Being justified as a gift by his grace through redemption. No, there's no world religion that has that. None. None, 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 none. And we're not a religion by the fact that we have it, it makes us unique and not a religion. They wouldn't let us in. I'm telling you, they wouldn't let us in. 
If, we, if you gave a preset message as qualifying to get into the world religions, they would boo you down and crucify you before the day was over. They, they did it to our founder. They will do it to us. <laughs> that should give you courage to speak the truth of God because we, we have the power to turn the world right side up. I believe that with all my heart. Turn my life that way. How about you, Billy? <laughs> it turned me right up. I went, whoa, there's God. How do you do, bud? How do you do? I'm told I can call you daddy. Who would have ever believed that? Who would have ever believed it? Or how about Romans 3rd chapter 28 through 30? Or is God a God of the Jews only? Uh, I think not. Is he not the God of the Gentile also? Yes, 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 yes. Oh, yes. Of the Gentiles also. Since indeed God who will justify the circumcised Jew by faith and the uncircumcised Gentile through faith, watch this, is one. <laughs> I don't show favor. Oh, to the Jew. Oh, you bet you've been oh, you've been around a long time. Oh, you Gentiles, you haven't. No, 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 no. You know what brings us into common ground? Christ dies on a cross, is buried and raised from the dead on the third day. That's the common ground. Jew comes to there, he gets to God. The Gentile comes to there, he gets to God. No man gets to the Father except through the Son. Yeah, I'm fired up. Got it. I'm tired of having people say Christianity is a world religion. It is not a religion. We would never get voted in. Now, there may be some churches could get, but not a church that like this that preaches the truth. They wouldn't let me in. They wouldn't give me an hour without crucifying me. They might give me an hour just to kill me. And that'd be all right because the only way they could do it was permission from God. And I have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with that at all. They don't have the power over my life. I don't even have power over my life. Nobody's got power over my life except what God extends it, and that's okay with me. Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, all are dead in Adam. Sin entered into the world. That's Adam's original sin. That's AOS. And death, spiritual death, through sin. And so spiritual death spread. I mean like wildfire. Spread like a disease. Spread to all mankind. Every human being is born in Adam's sin and has to be born again out of it. You say, that's a pretty narrow path. You got that right. That's why we're not a religion. You can lump all the other religions and put everybody in it that don't believe in Christianity. They're in it, and that's what's going to be in hell. World religions is going to fill hell. And Christianity, with the truth of the message of the gospel, will fill heaven. We should be passionate about this message. Uh, I've got to quit. I've got to get, give us a little space. When you come back in, you come back in, you pick up another paper. I'm going to teach you the seven doctrines of Christianity that separate us from the world and will separate us from churches of Christianity. Taken from Ephesians, the fourth chapter, four through six. Let's have a word of prayer. The men will take the offering. We're going to do... They're going to do the offering, <laughs> and then we're going to take a 15-minute break, have coffee and donuts and do what you have to do, and then we'll come back second hour for another lesson. I think you can get point three all right. 
I mean, not only are we separated on earth, but we're separated with death too. And I'll tell you, the rapture is the most powerful doctrine that we have. Nobody can even touch the, the doctrine of the rapture. Nobody can even touch it. <laughs> if you think everything I've said so far, you read point three, and you'll see something marvelous about Christianity that religions can't copy, not one I owed of. Father, we're so thankful for your love, mercy, and grace. Thank you for each person that's come our way by automobile and internet to study with us. I pray, Father, we've understood very clearly as best we could in a short time what separates Christianity from world religions and why Christianity is supreme. I pray, Father, this offering that we would be good stewards of it and the hearts that have given it have given it out of grace. The Holy Spirit has tugged and pushed them on their heart as they should give, and they've given honorably and obediently. And we will do the same thing, Father, as we pray over it and study over it and give it as we think is best serve the mission of the church in the world. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.